how do you like win that battle of the mind on a daily basis? Because you know, you're, you got a lot going on. I'm sure there's days you're tired, exhausted. Like, how do you win that battle? It's a battle that can't be won through motivation or self-inspiration or having Doug inspire me, motivate me, pump me up. It has to be internal. And the only thing internal is discipline. Because then when I'm, like I said, when I'm tired, when I'm hungry, when I didn't sleep well, I had nightmares, maybe me and the, me, me and the wife got into an argument. And so whatever. Discipline says that I have to live a structured life and that I need to work out, I need to eat right, I need to have a structured schedule in order to be able to run this big machine called HQ, where we have five or six businesses running out of here. And so some days I go to the gym under protest. I don't go there, you know, yippee, it's exciting, I can't wait. I go there under protest. Uh, and in fact, Leighton's worked out with me before. Uh, some days, most days, I'm mumbling to myself and talking to myself and, you know, literally coaching myself through the workouts in a positive way. Then there's those days that I woke up angry and bitter and didn't feel like going, so I'm going to the gym under protest, but I'm going anyway because of discipline. And in those days, I might be using very choice words that are not so motivational, not so inspirational. I'm just cussing up a storm at the dumbbells, at the pull-up bar, at the turf that I'm pushing the sled on. But guess what? I got it done anyway because discipline forces me to have structure. Motivation is fleeting. And I think one of the other things that kind of helps people stay accountable and keep going is like being accountable to somebody else and having a mentor and having people coach them. I know you coach some of the most successful people in, in, in my industry, in your industry, and that you've had mentors along the way too. And you mentioned that you don't let the, the, the feedback from your project event like consume your mind. But I also know that you have people in your corner that you bounce off ideas off of and people who maybe give you some constructive feedback so how can people balance those two? Because I feel like sometimes people are just so overconsumed with like negativity and stuff online, or they're the opposite where they think they know everything right. and they push everybody away. Yeah, and the solution to that that I found as I've gotten older is ego. The more I can control my ego, put it aside, because ego kind of puts on blinders and you stop seeing version of yourself. You stop seeing the arrogant version of yourself. You start surrounding yourself. If you're very egotistical, you start surrounding yourself with yes men and yes women who just want to appease you. If you can put the ego aside and go, hey man, give me honest feedback. Give me honest feedback. I need to improve and I don't know what I don't know and you guys have outside eyes on me. I trust your core values. I trust the kind of man you are. I, I love the character and the integrity that you walk in. Uh, same with you and same with you. So here it is, guys, brutal, honest feedback. I may get hurt, but give it to me anyway. And so it's imperative to do that. Most people don't do that because, well, you are going to get hurt. It doesn't feel good when a friend says, you know, B, this is how you show up sometimes. Oh, shit, I didn't realize I show up like a bull in a china closet. And then immediately we go to defense. Yeah, but the reason I was that, like that on that day is because I got some bad news from a coaching client, and, and he was upset, and I wanted to help him, but I couldn't. And so I came into HQ kind of red hot, you know? And so I didn't really mean, see, B, you're actually now being defensive about it. You asked me for feedback. And so you have to just sit there, put your ego aside, take the feedback. And then oftentimes I'll ask, well, can you give me examples? You know, give me examples. And instead of being defensive about it or explaining why it was that way, I go, got it, understood. So that's how you saw it? Yep. And that's what, how it made you feel? Yep. First off, I'm sorry. Secondly, it won't happen again. We need to ask for feedback. We need to cultivate feedback from people that we are aligned with in core values, character, and integrity, that we feel that you know, we honor them, we respect them. Because I won't go get feedback from someone who is fat and sloppy and out of shape and sloth-like because we just don't share the same vision, man. What's been like a shift that you've made in the last year that's led to a lot of growth for you? The shift that I made last year that's led to a lot of growth is, dude, I started my podcast, The Bedros Cooling Show. You, you and I have known each other for a while. I had The Empire Show for four years where I'm interviewing other entrepreneurs or me and Craig Ballantyne were co-hosts. You know, we're kind of bouncing things off each other. And I had The Empire Show for four years. We did 209 episodes. It was always me and somebody else. So you always feel like someone else is carrying the weight. Um, you know, if this episode thrives or if it doesn't, it was on us. I started the Bedros Cooling Show, and it's just me looking down the barrel of the camera, 
and delivering from my radiance, from my gut, speaking to men about the topics of men and about what's happening to humanity today and in our world today. And it's forced so much personal growth because that's when you realize, okay, I feel called to do this. But I also realize it all hinges on me. The success of every episode hinges on me. When people say they hate how this episode is, they're really saying how they hate me, right? So you have to develop a thicker skin, put, put more ego aside, develop even higher levels of self-confidence, become even more congruent, which led to me going, you know, because I would you know, tell people on the show, like, fellas, like, if you're over drinking, if you're over smoking weed, like, stop it. You know, you're just escaping from your, your realities. Why are you doing that? And then last November 12th, I was like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm drinking, I'm an occasional drinker. I'll drink at a restaurant, I'll have a cocktail or two, or when I'm speaking at an event, if there's a meet and greet that's gonna happen, I had told myself, my story was, I'm an introvert, I don't like doing the meet and greet, but the event host who had me speak also paid extra for me to do the meet and greet. So I just have a couple of cocktails, I can loosen it up, take the edge off, do the meet and greet. Bro, I'm a grown man. I could take the edge off by just having good self-talk and then going out there and meeting people and asking great questions and letting them feel special and then taking a selfie picture with them. What the f- was I doing having two cocktails before going out there? I certainly wasn't addicted. I had a dependency, but that dependency did not serve me. So I had to lead with even more congruency by saying, guys, I stopped alcohol. I stopped weed. The next week I stopped weed. So November 12th, I stopped alcohol uh, last year. Uh, next week, I'm like, I'm not even going to smoke weed. Like I used to smoke weed like every... I don't know, four weeks or every six weeks. And then I got some wild hair up. And I'm like, the week after that, I was like, muscle stopping Diet Coke. And then I realized, wait a minute, I actually enjoy Diet Coke from time to time. I'm going to show some grace to myself. But um, you, you have to become more congruent when you do something that's just you looking down the barrel of a camera, speaking to the masses. And that's been the greatest self-development uh, leap that I've had in the last 12 months. Any of these limiting beliefs that you struggle with before, do they ever creep up on you, especially with what you're doing now? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. On May 20th, so as we sit here, today is October something, 19, 20, I don't know what it is. But on May 20th, I tore my tricep, like 95% of my tricep <laughs> retracted up. I was boxing with my son, and I threw a left cross, and he checked me, and pop goes my tricep. Working out is as therapeutic for me as it is just for physical health, uh, you know this. And so I found myself getting a little funky because I can't do chest presses, shoulder presses, tricep presses, can't do burpees, can't do push-ups. So I was literally using the uh, cable fly machine, 10 pounds, doing 200 reps at a time on one side and you could see your muscles atrophying. Everything had turned black and blue. The doctors are telling you they want to cut you and reattach and all this stuff. And you're like, but I got all these speaking gigs I got to do. I can't be in the sling and in the cast and I don't have the time or desire for that. And so the moment there's a life ambush, as my friend Jason Redman, uh, a retired Navy SEAL and former coaching client and now a dear friend, says, when you are at a, when you're sitting on the X of a life ambush, you're going to start the old, skeletons are going to come and start haunting you again. And hey, you know, you're going to start putting on weight. Hey, you're never going to be as strong again. Hey, you're never going to be as mobile again. You're not going to be able to wrestle your son again and do jujitsu and box. And so I've had to reconcile with that. But then I looked in the mirror one day and I was like, wait a minute, I'm able to contract that one little tricep. And I remember when I tore my bicep, I couldn't contract it because it was fully detached. I reread the MRI stuff and it's like, oh, one of the heads are still kind of attached. Smart enough to know that the body builds scar tissue. If I stay in a positive mental attitude, if I can eat healthy and clean, if I can give myself time to heal, if I can get ultrasound and laser treatments on that tendon, on that muscle, maybe there's hope. And so here we are. I haven't gotten the surgery. I'm 85% got my strength back. Uh, I'm about ready to go out and surf again because to surf, you have to do a burpee to pop up on your board, right? You paddle, 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 and then you catch the wave and you do a burpee to pop up on your board. And the burpee is what I wasn't able to do. And so I'm realizing that, dude, I might be able to actually live with a torn tricep because the rest of that muscle is developing and growing. Uh, but it put me in a funk because for a while there, I was disabled. 
And so the darkness comes, the self-doubt comes, the man being jacked and big and lean is part of my identity, right? Uh, same thing during the pandemic. We lost 218 franchise locations and Fit Body Bootcamp is definitely part of my identity. Like it's helped me grow. So again, another, another X that I was sitting on, ambush, life ambush. Uh, yet another one, three weeks ago, my mom died. We knew she was gonna die, she had Alzheimer's. I was there holding her hand, rubbing her head, talking to her, she took her last breath. Uh, we buried her just last week. She's her mom, man, You're, she's her connection to the world. Like you came from her, she's her connection to the world and you realize, I'm up next. And my mom was my best friend when we came to this country. My dad, my older brother, older sister, they all had multiple jobs. Me and my mom were trying to figure out Kmart and Jemco and Zodis and food stamps and how we're gonna you know, piece together food for that evening for the family. All these thoughts start coming in. And, and, and when those thoughts start coming in, you feel your vibrational frequency goes down. And when your vibrational frequency goes down, that is when the negative self-talk begins. That is when the limiting beliefs begin. So I almost look at it as like a Microsoft computer, Microsoft-driven computer. Like it can isolate the virus, but it's never gonna get rid of the virus. In fact, if you remember the McAfee virus scan and all these different virus scans that were out there, it always said, the virus has been quarantined. Never, it never removed it off the hard drive. It was quarantined. And I almost look, feel like an injury or any kind of life ambush can open up that box to allow the virus to come back up. This is why, again, you need great life structure, a good circle of influence who like believes in you, shares your core values, eat right, sleep right, have all your shit in order because the life ambush is inevitable. Mom's gonna die, pandemic's gonna happen, triceps gonna tear, Car accident's gonna happen, someone's gonna get diagnosed with cancer, and when they do, it is my structure and discipline that's gonna pull me through when the devil starts speaking and whispering in my ear. I think that's ultimately one of the biggest mindset shifts that people need to make is their relationship with pain and how they they know they need to like figure out a way to deal with that and not use it as an excuse to talk to drink more alcohol or smoke the weed right. or get into all these other- It's easier to do that. It's easier to go to the escape tools. I'm gonna watch so much TV that I don't think about my mom or my tricep until I get fat and ugly and, uh, right? It's, it's easy to do that. Or I'm just gonna drink and smoke until the pandemic's over. But now I've lost 500 locations instead of 200. You have to address the thing and you have to address it in the most inefficient way. And the most inefficient way is to actually problem solve through it. The efficient, but horrible way to do it is let me just smoke and drink and vice myself through it, but it only gets worse on the other side of it. So what are some of the things that you would recommend somebody doing if they're faced in the, in the thick of adversity? Maybe they're lacking the, the discipline that you have, but they're trying to, to, to work their way there when they've hit this roadblock and they don't know yeah. what to do. Well, uh, number one, build the life structure, the, the, the support system, your community, your circle of influence, control the thoughts and the input, do all of that, the discipline, do all of that before the life ambush comes. Like if you're watching this and listening to this and you're like, life is pretty good right now. Great, great. Build a better circle of influence around you. Build a better structure, more discipline. Get your workouts in, learn to eat right. So that when the inevitable, inevitable, not maybe, inevitable life ambush comes, you could lean on that. Now, if you're like, oh, I'd have no life structure. Everyone around me is a loser. I don't work out, I don't eat right, I'm smoking and drinking my way through, through the days, I feel horrible, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I just feel like the world is over, and I just got some bad news. I just hit the X of ambush. Holy hell, well, you know what? You do the three C's, you control what you can, you cope with what you can't control, and you concentrate on what counts. So in that moment, you're like, what can I control? Well, I can control my thoughts right now. I can control if I'm alone or if I'm talking to friends who actually care for me, love on me, and pour into me. I can control a workout. Maybe I don't wanna go to the gym on my own because I don't trust myself. I'll walk out after doing one set. So I'm gonna be like, hey, Doug, hey, Ed, can you guys come to the gym with me? Let's work out together. I'm in a dark place. I'm gonna lean on my community. I'm gonna start reaching out, but I'm not gonna be the lone wolf because the lone wolf dies, the wolf pack survives. I'm gonna trust on my pack, control the controllables, cope with what you can not control in that moment or in that phase of life and then understand that con you have to concentrate on what counts. And there's only a small handful of things you need to concentrate on. Like, am I working out? Am I eating right? Do I have a good circle of influence? You know, okay, am I showing gratitude for even being alive? And maybe you're like, actually, I don't wanna be alive right now. I don't wanna be alive right now. So I'm not grateful for being alive. 
Oh, okay. Uh, you know, there's a dude with like one leg and one prosthetic leg um, hobbling through life. You got two working legs. So maybe if you just compare yourself and realize maybe it's okay to be alive. Maybe I do have it better than some people. And this is just a phase of life and this too shall pass. And we have to look at it that way. If we don't, we start making these permanent decisions while under temporary feelings. Uh, and that is the worst way to lead yourself through life. I'm sure a lot of people come to you and they struggle with the victim mindset. They're feeling sorry for themselves. They're like in that mode of like, well, I'm never going to be like that person. My life sucks. I must not be worthy or whatever. Like, how do you, how do you help somebody snap out of that? It, it goes back to the very first answer. Get lean and jacked. If, if they're in that state, my life's not worthy. I'm not in a good place. You know, this sucks. I'm the victim. Odds are they also have 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 pounds to lose. And so, hey, I got an idea. Let's get lean and jacked. Wait, what? I'm in a dark place right now. Great, great. Let's go get lean and jacked. Because again, hire a coach, a nutrition coach, a personal trainer, pay money, be held accountable, get lean and jacked. How's that going to help me? I'm in a very dark place right now. I'm the victim. I get it. But once you have abs, once you have veins in your body, once you feel proud of this vessel that you've built, you have such high confidence. You have such great rapport with yourself. You have such great reputation with self that you're like, bring on the new challenge, sir. All of a sudden, that doubt and depression and all that goes away. It starts with self. Starts with the self. 